Hello and welcome. Well, we woke up this morning to, I don't know, good news, old news, but there's been literally a reshuffle among government appointees. Now, as a citizen, when you hear this reshuffle, does it bring you that breath of fresh air that says, this is it, the country is now heading towards the path that we wanted it to go? Or is it just old wines and new skins? What is it? I mean, what is it that comes or decides a reshuffle? Because sometimes you realize that some ministers have not stayed long enough in their position to implement whatever policies. Uh, sometimes they haven't even gotten the money to implement the policies and then they are shipped off to another department. But my worry is that there were a lot of deputy this, deputy that. In this country, with all our struggling economy and all our monies that is not enough to go around, what is the use of deputy regional ministers? I mean, there's the minister, there are DCs. What role does the deputy play? And that's what we're going to find out today. Indeed, Prosper Barney made a, a big comeback, which surprised everyone. Fifi Kwete went to transport, which also was big news. But we're going to have a broad conversation to find out. Assuming you were a floating voter, because those who vote MPP, you know, can't do anything about them. And those who are going to vote NDC can't do anything. But if you are a floating voter, are these some of the changes that make you think, hmm, let me think again. Folks, my name is Nanan Sakwa. This is PM Express. And when I come back, I will introduce my guest, a man who speaks his mind, and we will talk. Don't move. Well, thank you very much for staying Ministerial Reshuffle, who goes where? And with me in the studio is Elvis Dako, who is the editor of the Finder newspaper. Now, I was very biased with the Finder newspaper when I was, uh, you know, used to do the uh, morning show. Because I just like their stories. I thought it was objective enough. And then I liked the print quality. So I, you know, I was always... <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, <laughs> So I always looked out <laughs> yeah. for the finder and found a story in there. And, you know, I just thought, you know, so well done. Thank you, Hannah. Thank well you done. very much. Yes, yes. I always used to go on We appreciate your support. <laughs> <laughs> I always used to go about the finders. So those of you who read the finder all the time, there's your editor. Indeed, he's been on the show before, but I wasn't here. It was Malik who was uh, hosting him. So Elvis Dako, editor of the finder newspaper. And uh, my brother, you report news as they happen. I mean, that's your life, basically. Yeah. Now, so if you wake up this morning and you see the reshuffle that has come today, does it give you that sense that, whoa, this is it. This is what Ghana needs. These are the A team who are going to channel us to achieve our dream. Well, my answer is no. Because um, with the experience from 93 till today, mm. I have realized that ministerial reshuffle really have little bearing on what happens in government. Mm. I say this from the viewpoint that the appointees are going to whatever ministry they will be appointed to, to execute the policy of the government, which is driven by the president and the cabinet. So I have come to realize that we have ministerial reshuffles, sometimes necessary, sometimes not necessary, for various reasons. But for me, the most important aspect I look at is what is the impact of policy implementation? Mm -hmm. Does it sign a signal that government says we want to change direction? We think that the direction we are going, something is not going well, that is why we need to change. For me, th those are the issues I want to be looking at. Because if, if a minister goes to a ministry, I, I, I ask myself, what change is he going to make when it comes to policy of the government for that particular ministry? Mm. I think the minister goes there just as a manager to supervise, to make sure that if the resources are released for, for the, the programs and policies, they are implemented as agreed by the government. So, so for me, I just see them as managers. So normally I realize that, and, and that's what my, I have seen that, mm -hmm. Ministers who people call for to be removed are not being asked to be removed because they are not implementing the policies of the government, but we are calling for them to be removed because probably they have issues with the people they work with, maybe their management style, 
and how they go about their work. People think that they are not efficient or they are being too harsh. So for, for, for me, call for ministerial reshape for people to be removed. I have seen it mostly as if the person that we are asking to be removed is somebody that at the particular ministry or agency the person is, his or her management style does not go down well with the people that is working with, then people agitate that such. And so when such people are removed, people are actually happy that such a person is removed. But as to whether really that person's removal has any impact, and whether the person that is coming is coming with something that will change policy direction, really, I really don't see. Because at the end of the day, when they are removed, we are actually even not told why they are removed. Mm. And we are not told that, OK, this person was given a target to achieve this for a period of six months or one year. But after the period, it is realized that he's not be able to achieve this, and that reason is being removed. So for me, I have seen ministerial <coughs> appointment as just something that will come, but when it comes to policy direction, it's a bit, uh, uh, it doesn't really make much change. Because see, for instance, I can say, let me say for instance, for, for finance ministry, when uh, Dr. Dufour was not reappointed by President Mahama and uh, Sir Tekbe took over, the question was Tekbe asked that, okay, as the Minister of Finance, you must make sure that GRA increases the tax uh, base and not, not just tax the people already pay, but rather expand the tax base by this percentage within two years or three years. For Setekwe to be judged that, okay, that mandate giving you to ensure that the tax base is expanded has not been achieved. For that reason, you are being removed. All these things we are not being told. For me, once the person is there just to implement the policy of the government, and, and if the person is removed, and you ask yourself, why is the person removed? You need to be asking certain questions that are, if, for instance, a Greek ministry, Fifi Kwete is removed today. The question, why should somebody be happy or not be happy? I want to ask myself, since 2009 to uh, 2015 that NDC came to power, the budget of Ghana has revealed that the contribution of a Greek to GDP keeps dropping. Okay. And we have lost about 12.8% of our Greek contribution to GDP. That is a huge percentage in terms of contribution. 12.8% is a huge drop. The question is, why have we explained this for seven years? It means that the policy that the government agreed that should be implemented, there's something wrong. Is it the minister that should change the policy, or is it the government that will say the policy direction that we want to go to is not helping, so we want to change it? So these are some of the things that sometimes we look at. For, but for me, this particular reshuffle, the, the one I can say I'm excited about or I support is the removal of Mark Uyongo as interior minister. Mm -hmm. Because this is the man that is in charge of internal <coughs> security for mm -hmm. the country. And there was an election, and, and, and there's a problem with the election in terms of violence. And a radio station calls the minister and interviews him and says, violence begets violence. Yeah. Whatever explanation he has given for that statement, I don't buy it. Because I don't think that the man in charge of internal security will tell me that because of A, B, C, D example, violence begins. That is not why he is there. So for me, in an election year like this, for him to remain in that position as the uh, interior minister, the man in charge of internal security, I think it will be a big compromise. So for me, that is something that I'm excited about because I, I, I'm really not impressed by how that particular how about his How about his response that he wasn't fully briefed uh, you know, with these uh, Guantanamo guys coming, you think you could have handled it better? Yes, of course, we could have handled it better because you work in a government, and the government has taken a decision that this is the way we're going to do. If you are not satisfied, I think you make that point to the president who appointed you, or when you have a cabinet meeting, because Interior is a, a cabinet minister. So you make your point to the cabinet and say, look, the way this issue has come up, I think that have not been briefed well enough on the issue, and I don't think that is the right thing. But to come out and tell the whole public that the decision that has been taken by the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces in conjunction with national security, you, the man in charge of internal security, you have not been well briefed. I think that that was a big goof on his part. And I think that if, if the president even removes him for that, the president will have every right to do so, mm -hmm. because you really just tell the people that things have been done behind your back. And then your deputy minister comes on a, a radio station and says, no, I was at the meeting where the decision was taken, and I remembered briefing you as my boss that this is the decision that has been taken. So clearly, that was a big <laughs> gap on his part as a, as a minister. But so for see, me, I, I had a problem with the deputy's response because he said that he'd gone to South Africa for a uh, checkup. Anytime I hear any 
any government officer a travel it, for checkup. I don't it? buy it because it, we are in a technological world. <laughs> if a minister is in <coughs> South Africa and the disease is taking, you can't call him, you can't send an email, you can't send a, a text message or what. I, that, that kind of explanation, it, it should not fly <laughs> in, 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 in our part mm -hmm. of the world, or in this technological world. I'm told in Rwanda, the president will not accept anything you write on paper. Every memo and everything you write is electronic. You need to send it to him through an email because you want to promote technology administration. So, so if you are telling me that in this day and age, because a decision is taken and your minister is outside the country, you wait till he returns. What if the country is burning? The country should burn before he returns. No, I don't think that that explanation, if that is what the deputy minister is, I don't think that it flies. For me, I will not buy that. So for me, this Richard, as I said, the one I would say that I'm enthused about is Mankuyongo's removal. Because that statement that violence begets violence, I think that he got it really wrong. Elvis, how about uh, Neil Ante for sports? I think everybody seems to be happy because uh, he's like a sportsman. He's, you know, he's a grassroots man. He's there with the boys. Uh, and I've listened to a couple of sports analysts and they think, no, he's the right man for the job. Well, the history of the sports ministry after uh, E.T. Mensah left has shown that the minister that appointed really did not last. And mm. somebody just did the list for... Uh, this particular administration from 2009, we already have seven gone. So if Min Lote comes to be the eighth minister for the said, mm. we had eight years administration, so on the average, it means that every year, yeah, we are well. changing once, so well. we are appointing <laughs> a sports minister. So I think that history should tell us that hey, people being enthused about his appointment, mm. I don't think that is something that anybody, and, and for him, people to say that he being a sports commentator, being in the industry, yes, it's an advantage. Mm. If he use it well, he could succeed. Mm. Be, because he has been in the sports I mean, I think, I think But then we should also not forget that someone like Nino Tedia was also a sports minister. But he has also been a, a good radio uh, a sports journalist and commentator. No, no, but no, he couldn't I mean, really go far in no, that ministry. Nino has actually been there with the boys. You know, yeah. he's played before with some of the old names, you know. Uh, he, was, he was actually set up, he's, you know, he's set off to be a footballer. Yeah. And then... Uh, his path diverted and then became, you know, went into politics. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That if he will be able to rely on all that he has learned through mm -hmm. the process to today and will apply it, probably he may be successful. Mm. But, you see, in the sports ministry, it's become like something is there that if you go there, no matter what you do, if you are not careful, as I said, since E.T. Mensah left, that ministry has been a ministry of a lot of issue. Mm. And, you see, Neil Antebadapo is the kind of person who will term as a no-nonsense person that when you do something that he thinks you are wrong, he will not hesitate telling you in the face. Mm. And that, I believe that he is likely to have confrontation with some of the sports associations, especially the Ghana Football Association, because we've seen mm. the way they have reacted to their done things, and they have come under a lot of criticism. So if there should be a minister who, when you do something wrong, he will not hesitate to tell in the face, then probably there's going to be some, it's likely that if that should happen, there will be some confrontation between him and the GFN. And you Ghana, if you talk about Minister of Sports, the first thing that comes to mind is the Ghana Football Association because we have promoted football above all other sports mm -hmm. so much that when you mention Minister of Sports, the first thing that comes to mind is football. So mm -hmm. if he's seen as somebody who is trying to do something that maybe probably confronting GFA and some, somebody may think that, oh, the guy has come with an agenda against GFA or something. So all these things will come to play when he finally takes office. So I think that the, the most important is for him to, to look at the history of the ministers who have been there, leverage on his own experience, as he said, who, somebody who set out to be a footballer, who has been a sports commentator for so many years with GBC before moving into politics. If you really can rely on, on, on those experiences and then have consultation with key sports personalities and stakeholders in the country I think that will, will, will help him. I only wish he's able to do that. Uh, Prosper Vine has also caused uh, quite a stir. Uh, he's come back into in, in interior. I mean, uh, what, what's your take on that? Oh, Prosper Vine coming into interior, we look at his background, somebody who has uh, a lot of work in conflict resolution and management, work with the United Nations and all that. I think that he really has the background. But as mm -hmm. to whether that will translate into the work he's going to do, only time will tell. And as you said, people are, seeing, are really enthused at all 
there are a lot of talk about his mm. return to government because mm. he was the chief of staff. Yeah. And being a chief of staff in Ghana, probably you are like the prime minister. You mm. you 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 are even seen as more important than the vice president mm. of the of the mm -hmm. country because in the constitution, the vice president you say it is the duties that the president will assign to him that you perform. But when you look at the position of a chief of staff in this republic from 93 to now, you realize that powerful. all the chief of staff have been very powerful it's people powerful. because it's like day to day, everything that the president does, it is in consultation with the chief of staff. Mm. So when you are in that position, you come under a lot of pressure. And there are a lot of people who will come to seek a lot of favors and for their own parochial interest. Mm. And if you are a chief of staff and you try to tell them, look, this can't be possible, it can't be done, clearly, the, the person is a, a party person and wants something, you are a chief of staff saying that this cannot be. So you really face a lot of challenges if you are a chief of staff in this country. So for me, all the problems he had as chief of staff, it's just because people may be looking for several things and they may think that he may be a stumbling block for what they are looking for. And, 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 and you, they, you got the time people were even questioning whether he is really an NDC person <laughs> and he had to produce some documents and the history, <laughs> all kind of things. And even Julius Zebla, who people actually christened as the, the grassroots and the party man, uh, just recently people are even calling for his head because of this bus rebranding issue that has come up. So it's when you are a chief of staff in this country, I think that you even bear more pressure even more pressure. than the president because anybody that wants to have something to do with the president will have to go through you, the chief of staff. But just so to it becomes a, a very mm. difficult position to handle. So I think that how come to the interior ministry, the pressure will be less. Mm -hmm. The pressure will be less at the interior. So Prosper Bani at the interior ministry, if really what he went through is because of these pressures as a chief of I think he should do well at the interior ministry. I mean, just to divert a little bit. And he's a man of few words. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that he will be the type who will go around granted the kind of interviews that maybe Uyungu granted and <laughs> landed him in trouble. In trouble. Uh -huh. In trouble. Let's divert a little bit, staying with the chief of staff. I think Julius is, when, when Julius was first promoted to chief of staff, I got worried because I thought, you know, he's too much of him, he's a nice guy. But uh, I think he stood, he stood his ground. Uh, of course, there are a few people who have, you know, if you don't do your work well, you know, there's a letter to say, look, go home. Uh, and I think, I think he's done well in that position. Oh, yeah. He, maybe those who know Julius very will tell mm. you, yes, he's a down-to-earth person. Mm. He's a party man, mm. grassroots person. But it's always somebody who also insists that the right things mm. be done. So for those who know him, that is mm. why when he was appointed, deep end this will tell you that this man is likely to succeed as a good chief of staff mm. because they've known him in the past. They've known what he has done. They know his character. They know that he's a man that will come down to your level, do everything. But when you are wrong, he will not hesitate to tell you that, my friend, mm. what you have done, you are wrong. And I think that that is something that is helping him in his mm. job. And I hope that it continues that way because sometimes people think that when you are down to earth and you come to their level and when they do something where you are not supposed to caution them or punish them. And that is the problem. Once you decide to do that, people think that, oh, the guy is a bad person. But I think that he has been able to manage the, the, the party interest and government interest. And I think so far, he has been able to manage that very well. And, and as I, told, I said this morning on Joy, if you have been appointed as a gov to serve in a government, you must learn how to manage the interest of party and the interest of government in, together. Because it is through the party that the government came to power. So if you are appointed to any position, no matter how competent you are and you are focused on your job, you cannot neglect the interest of the party. Mm. So how to balance this is the problem that a lot of government appointees face. Some people think that because they are appointed to positions, everything about the party should, should, should be on the back burner. But if you do that, the party will be angry with you mm. because they will say that we all work for the party to come to power. If today you are you have been appointed mm. to serve in a capacity, we expect that you use that expertise to help the government to deliver as well as consider the interests of the party. And I think that is what Julius is doing very well. And I hope other appointees, whether part, whichever party you are in, you need to understand this, yeah, this dynamics that look, the party came to power, that is why you got appointment. So no matter how competent you are focused on your job, deliver to help the government but you must also manage the interest of the party. And that, I think, is the, the difficulty a lot of politicians face in this country. That's why you see foot soldiers chasing 
uh, 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 government appointees <laughs> out left and right from because you see sometimes when you go even the way the person will talk to you puts you off mm. but when you go and the person gives you a good reception even if at the end of the day that appointee is not able to even give you what you say you say oh at least he was very nice yes. he showed that at least he respect me that i'm a party member and i also contributed for the party coming to power so that reception alone mm -hmm. is enough that you go to some government appointees and know that he knows you very well that we all are in the same region or constituency and we all work together but you stay there like three hours and virtually he's in the office there not that he's even doing any government mm -hmm. business but he just doesn't want to see you mm -hmm. if you are the type of person and you think that you get an appointment at the end of the day you have problem with the with, with the entity appointment can never be done eh, without consulting the party uh, uh, decision makers hold on to that let me take a break and then when i come back and the second part, we want to look at the issue of deputy this and deputy that. What, I mean, what role do they play? Because they just seem to be there. I can't do anything unless the minister says. I can't. You invite them even to this show, oh, unless you call my minister. So, I mean, what role do they play? Stay tuned, we're coming. Well, thank you very much uh, for staying and the uh, ministerial reshuffle which happened today, who goes where and how important it is. And, uh, you know, we've had quite an extensive uh, discussion, but in this part, I want to find out, uh, you know, deputy this, deputy that. Uh, I mean, what, what, what's the role of deputy ministers? Uh, I think, as I said, with the president and the vice president. <laughs> It, it's just like it's an office that until your boss tells you that do this or that, on your own, you can't move. For and me, half of the time they don't talk. Yeah, I, 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 I have always said that if you look at the structure of the ministries and institutions we have, I don't think that we need a deputy minister. Because, see, when you go to the ministry, the key people are all at post, mm. including a chief director who supervises the activities of every department in the ministry. Mm. So if we need a political appointee to go and serve as a manager, that will make sure things are done. I think a minister, one minister, is enough. Mm. Because when the ministers go there, truth of the matter is that they virtually are the, they really don't be, do anything because the department know what they are supposed to do. Virtually, they only bring files to them to see hey, this thing, this is what we are doing. This thing, this is what he just raised to and sign on. So when I see minister and a deputy or two ministers in one ministry, I ask myself, is it that we just enjoy giving people positions? Because for me, I believe that if we have a minister and is supported by the uh, chief director, okay. the ministry can function and function very well. Because with, even without a minister, a ministry can still function. Because whatever they do, it ends up on the desk of the chief director. And the chief director provides the direction and guidance that the ministry needs. So if we have these people mm. at the ministry, for me, I don't even see the need for a deputy minister at all. So if you ask me whether they are even relevant, I don't even see that they should be there in the first place, let alone whether <laughs> they are relevant. Yeah, because if you, if, as I said, you look at the, the structure of our ministry, mm. then you go there, you say, chief uh, director in charge of technical, director in charge of that. There are so many directors because they've divided their jobs and say, okay, uh, these units are key to this particular mm -hmm. ministry, so mm -hmm. each unit should have a director. Mm. And those directors also report to the chief director. So in effect, even if there's no minister, that ministry can mm -hmm. still achieve. Function. But because of, uh, a government wants to make sure that, okay, I want this policy implemented, the chief director is a civil servant. Mm. He cannot be under my uh, control all the time. So I need an appointee to go there to make sure that what I want that ministry to do, yes. it is being done so that that appointee can report to me that, yes, this ministry is doing the policy that the government mm -hmm. has put in place. I think that one minister should be able to do that communication between government and the institution and then rather make the ministry more effective. Mm -hmm. But at this point in time, because you have a minister, you have a deputy minister to, or two deputy ministers, it's just like the people who are actually really doing the work are not being seen. Because at every function, if the minister doesn't go, his deputy must go. So the key people who are really doing it, who are the ones who should be seen telling us that at this ministry, this is what we are doing. The no, oh, this is the chief director. He's saying that this one, this one, this one does not have a political condition. He's telling us the reality. We are rather really not seeing them. But we are rather seeing politicians 
Then they write for them. They decide to, oh, this one, I don't think it's good to put it as well. I change it. And then they come and sell it. So for me, truth of the matter is that I have never in my life, and I, I, I will be so happy if a day comes and we scrap the positions of deputy mm -hmm. ministers okay. completely. Because I think that if the minister thinks, I can't go for a function, I can't go and do this. Nothing stops me from a uh, delegate the mm -hmm. chief director or a director of that particular unit mm -hmm. in the ministry mm -hmm. that is handling that issue. Mm -hmm. I think that I should be able to delegate that person for the person. Because in the end, those who are even more knowledgeable than the minister, the deputy minister, because they have been in that yeah, department see, and see, working see, on those see. issues for so many years. Mm -hmm. So when they come there, they understand the issues even better. Mm -hmm. How long will a minister last? If the minister comes, the minister, it takes me like even a year for him to even understand how the ministry even functions. But this is something that those who have been there 10, 15 years ago, they know the in and out. So why don't we rather let these people be the ones into doing the job? These are the people that we must promote for Ghanaians to know that if you go to this ministry, these are the key people. Right now, everything seems like if you go to every ministry, it's the minister, it's the deputy minister. But the truth of the matter, when you come to the real job that has been done, it's they are not the ones it. doing it. Let me go on the phones and speak to uh, David Agbe. Uh, David, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Nana. Thank you. One day you have to be in the studio. You're always talking to me on the phone. You have to come to the studio. Nana, I will kindly pay you a special homage. Thank you very much. <laughs> Nana, you deserve it. <laughs> David, we are talking to a subject, uh, a subject which is uh, you know, on your doorstep and about ministerial reshuffle. David, I want you to start from the panel. Uh, is, is it... Uh, should we know the track record of people going into certain ministries as citizens? Should, if they are taking, let's say, Fifi Kwete to transport, should we know that, ah, look, this guy is very good at transport because he done A, B, C, D before. Or for us, well, the, government, the president said he should go, so he should go. Nana, thank you once again for the opportunity. You're welcome. I, I must say that uh, I was actually listening to... Uh, the gentleman in your studio, Elvis. very passionate, talking about, you know, the issue. Yes. I, I, I could say that uh, politics is a very complex, you know, profession. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand it at that point of view. And we should try as much as possible to separate what I will call uh, political administration from a typical political appointee which in political science, uh, one who propounded uh, political administration, uh, Woodrow Wilson, he was a former president of America. He tried to say that we should try as much as possible to dichotomize between the two, a typical politician who is a political appointee as a minister from a, a policy administrator who is sitting at the office at uh, maybe a policy advisor, when we try as much as possible to separate the two, we will be able to appreciate what politics is all about and policy making processes and how policy could actually achieve a certain result. Mm -hmm. So when we understand it from that point of view, we'll be able to appreciate the fact that when you go to the ministry, we have a chief uh, director there and we have a minister, a minister is appointed to serve a particular term, maybe two months or one year or five years down the line, he, he is gone. But when you are appointed as a, a chief director, your term of office, you can live there for uh, as much as God could determine, almost about 60 years down the line before you go on retirement. But if you are appointed as a minister, your term of office is so short between four years or two years or one year, six months, you are gone. And so that is where we need to position the, the debate. And I must say that the frequency issue that you raised, yeah. one would have expected that a uh, frequency would be properly assessed based on his background, what he can do, what his level of knowledge when it comes to, uh, um, let's say, um, transport. He used to be a minister, a deputy minister for finance. At yeah. that point in time, uh, Fifi Kwete distinguished himself very well. But at a, at a certain point in time, the president thought it wise that he has to promote him to a great ministry as a substantive minister there. And now he has been shifted again to a different position. 
So one way or the other, looking at it purely from administrative point of view, you could say that all the knowledge that he has acquired from the Ministry of um, um, Finance and Agriculture, one way or the other, he might lose that institutional memory or his institutional memory may not be able to benefit other ministries, but it is an experience. It, it is an accumulation of an experience that he has gathered from all these kind of ministries. So uh, going to transport, he is going to ensure and, and try as much as possible to internalize what government wants to achieve as far as the Ministry of Transport is concerned. Mm -hmm. So one would have expected or one would wish that Fine enough, let's assess him based on his uh, credential, based on his qualifications. But politics, as soon as you involve yourself into politics, you should have that balance act. On, let me, David, 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 of jobs. David, on, 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 uh, you know, if we look at Fifi's uh, Agric track record and what, uh, how Agric has slumped uh, during his term during, uh, within the Agric uh, would you want to make him a minister? I mean, if, if we were going by track records. Uh, frankly, and I, I must say that when CP was at the Ministry of Finance, he was more visible yeah. than any other ministry that he has been assigned to. I agree. Uh, when he went to the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Matt was not seen. Uh, and so you could say that uh, Fifi's job description or his right position wasn't a, a, a great minister. And so I will wish that Fifi could, it, it's more like anybody, you know, at all could link Fifi to more like a communication because many Ghanaians appreciated him when he was uh, a propaganda secretary of the NGC then. Mm. Uh, especially you heard him you know, trying to say, uh, set the record straight, which has been a ringing tone. Mm. And so people got to know PC as a very creative communicator then during opposition time. But transitioning into government, I, I could say that he performed creditably well at the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning than uh, the, the uh, Agric Ministry. And currently, let's try and see what he will try as much as to justify his inclusion whilst he has also been uh, pushed to Ministry of Transport. Let's see and let's weigh uh, and, and see what he's going to exhibit over there. Generally, these re reshuffles, I mean, uh, w w what does government hope to achieve with, with, with these reshuffles? Now, now, looking at it politically and in governance point of view, I think that when reshuffle is done, what is expected is that they need to bring some kind of innovation, some kind of energy into governance. And they want, also want to achieve some level of regional balance and equity within the region so that at least uh, people could have a sense of belonging to the party. And you know, politics is, is also about a passion. It's also about emotional satisfaction. So one way or the other, if somebody is appointed as a, a minister uh, for a, a great coming from maybe a uh, Volta region or from Eastern region or from Bronahapo, the people there will have that emotional satisfaction that at least our region has been recognized. Mm. Our region has, has, uh, has produced a minister or our region is included in the government and so government will tend to also benefit a certain reasonable vote from that region. Mm -hmm. So politics, you, you cannot negate the fact that it gives some kind of social cohesion mm -hmm. and gives a level of motivation to party food soldiers within you know, the region that they come from. And so it is expected that if you are reshuffle or if government does you know, reshuffling, he is expecting new ministers to bring some kind of energy into his political administration such that it will mirror to their political advantage. That is the purpose of doing uh, a, a, a reshuffling and try as much as possible to assess the capa uh, capability and the strength of those people that you, 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 you are bringing into your administration. So government needs to look at doing proper assessment 
and performance measurements of various ministers that uh, the president has actually appointed. I think that um, job evaluation might have been done uh, to assess their performance at their various levels and to also be able to satisfy their constituents that, yes, government appreciate the fact that somebody from a country region has been appointed as a minister, somebody from Upper East okay. or Upper West has been appointed uh, Eastern region. I, I heard uh, the uh, renowned chief that I love mentioning his name so much, uh, Osajifu Amwetia Upolupeni, yeah. a very renowned person. Uh, quite recently, he made a remark that uh, I think has been relegated mm -hmm. to the background. And quickly enough, the president has listened to his voice, and then the president has appointed a lady, Amma Frimpon, as you know, substantive <laughs> or designate minister for mm -hmm. uh, Eastern region. It, it, it tells you that politics is a very complex game, and one way or the other, you need to measure the emotions of the people and be able to recognize a certain you know, prominent people who express their views about what government is doing and what government can do you know, for them to better their living standards and also have a sense of recognition that the president acknowledged people from the eastern region. So politics, we need to look at it from that complex point of view and to be able to say that, yes, Politics, you know, you need to add a bit of science to politics, and that is what makes it com uh, I mean, complex. If you look at it from David. English point of view, you might not understand politics, but politics is a science, and so you need to have that as David, thank of, you. Of science. Thank you very much for that contribution. Thank you so much. Uh, Nana, I will... It's always a pleasure, but I, I hope and pray that I will pay you a special hope. I, 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 I am now. definitely waiting for that visit. I'm going to take a break here, and then when I come back, I'll come to the studio and find out from Elvis, what is it that, uh, you know, any time there's going to be a reshuffle, there's so much panic among the ministers. What is the big fear? Don't move. Well, thank you very much for staying and discussing the interesting subjects and the complicated subject of politics and the governance and reshuffle. But uh, uh, during the break, you mentioned something which I think is quite important uh, with regards to Fifi going into a Greek, we're saying a Greek slum. But you mentioned that, well, he didn't get the money to, you know, to, to work. So that, what that, does he do? That is the issue I raised earlier in the program that if you say, you are doing ministerial reshuffle. I'm not interested. I want to know the pol policy direction. If mm -hmm. you think a particular ministry needs change, it's not the individual that I think needs change. I think that the policy, we must find out. What did you set out to achieve? Did you provide the resources to be able to achieve that? Mm -hmm. If you, the answers to these two questions are yes, this is what we attend to, this is how much we need to invest. We put the money there, but the results are not as We think that the minister didn't do good supervision. Then I understand. But physical things, before I talk about Greek slamming from mm. 90, uh, all the way to this time, when I look at it also, you can clearly see from the budget that almost every year the uh, allocation for a Greek, they don't it's get dropping. all the money. Really so dropping. if you don't have the resources to implement the policy, definitely the military will not achieve the target. So for me, I'm looking at us as a country be going forward saying that, okay, we want to achieve this at this ministry. These are the resources needed. It has been delivered to the ministry. So if they don't meet that target, then the people who are managing the place need to be removed. Mm. Then we can say, okay, you are being removed because you could not achieve something that you were told to achieve when you were appointed. But when the resources have not been provided to the various ministries, because we say the country is, is, is in crisis, which we all understand, mm. because if you are with the IMF, the IMF is a lender of last resort. So if we are in a three-year IMF, it clearly shows that the resources are not there. Mm. So definitely budgetary allocations that we think that this ministry needs so much to do what they want to do. Although we put in the budget, at the end of the day, we are not going to provide the resources. So clearly, if we are talking about assessing the people who are the ministries, then we also need to be looking at, first of all, what did they set out to achieve? What mandate were they given? And the resources that they need to execute the mandate, were they given the resources? If the resources are not given, then there's no business saying that the person could not deliver on his or her mandate at whichever ministry you put in. Because the person is not using his own resources, and it's not a magician to conjure anything from anywhere. That's why we have a budget that says that Ministry A needs so much to do A, B, C, D. So if you can't provide the resources, why do we judge people by it? So that's why I say if the president has said, okay, Minister of Agriculture, we think that 
we've not provided the resources, that's why we are not meeting. But this year, we are going to make all the resources available to the agri ministry and see whether oh, they'll still meet the let target me, or let not. Me, let me deviate and come back. We've been running this system since 1992, over 20 years. Yes. Uh, so if we look at where Ghana was then and look at Ghana today, I mean, 20 years is, is a you know, it's enough time to, you know, change any country. I mean, Dubai changed in 20 years, Singapore. All Rwanda did it less than 20 years. Pokagani did it less than 20 so, years. So that one, they were even coming from war after <laughs> killing them. So, so about 800,000 so people. So are we running the wrong formula? No, yes, because the reason we are not getting anywhere is that we have not set targets for ourselves as a nation. And we are not holding people to the targets. We started with Vision 2020. Then when the MPP will say Vision 2015. Today, who hears anything about whether we are doing Vision 2020 or Vision 2015? We have the 40-year plan. Which for, so what, what, they are now doing consultation before drawing up that plan. Brazil operates a four-year development plan. Every four years, they draw up a new development plan. And Brazil is making fantastic progress. So why are we talking about, we, do we have 2020, 2015, and now we are talking about 40 years? We need to set targets for ourselves as a nation in education. We want to achieve this by this time. These are the resources that will be needed to deliver that. We are ready to put the resources there to make sure that it is done. If it's every six months that we will do assessment to find out whether really we are on course, we must do it. But when we are not doing this thing, if you look, you ask for statistics in this country about unemployment, you can't find it. A lot of statistics you need for planning, it is not there. So if you don't have targets to achieve, it is just like any road leads you to where you are going. That is why we will always be thinking that, oh, we are doing well. Doing well based on what? Because if you don't have a target, if you don't say that in education we are hitting this, and it's okay, yes, we have been able to get 80% of that target, then we can pat ourselves in the back and say, yes, we are heading there. But it is like we've not set serious targets of ourselves to achieve. So anything that we get, we say, oh, we are doing well. But you see, we can never get it there Be until we set targets for every sector. If GRA boss is appointed and we say revenue is key to this country, he or she must be given a target that 2 million Ghanaians out of maybe 7 or 8 million working Ghanaians pay tax. The 5 million, in one year, you should add additional 1 million not increasing the tax on the few that are paying. You give that person that one year, add one million or 500,000 to the people who are paying tax. If by the one year the person is not able to achieve that, you take him out. That is the only way government and politicians will realize that I have a mandate. If I'm not able to deliver, I'll be sacked. And because I want to keep my job, I must find the strategies to get there. But if these targets are not there, and GRA is only giving, uh, get to this uh, amount of revenue and then they go to the port and increase the port charges in order to get the amount we are not going anywhere because we know that the few people who are paying we cannot continue to increase the taxes we must add those who are out there to the number mm -hmm. so so for instance this is what we saw if finance ministry sits and say okay the GRA uh, the director could not achieve so we are we must go another person then the finance minister know that he's doing his job so you see until we sit down so that's why when they remove minister and say, ah, what is the deal? The president doesn't owe anybody an explanation. That's it, then we are not going anywhere. <laughs> the president might owe us explanation because the president came to power and said, I will do A, B, C, D. So if you are appointing somebody, you must tell us that I appointed the person, gave the person this to do. So if I'm moving the person tomorrow, we will judge the person by the performance. This is the result. So if the person can achieve, we cannot. Why? See, people say we should remove tech. I say, why do you remove tech? Pay? Tekpe is saying that we all know that our debts are heading towards unsustainable levels. Mm. We cannot continue to spend money that we don't have. So let's limit spending. So I will not release so much money. Then NDC people are angry. Tekpe is the one running down the economy because it's not releasing money. Where is the money? You must generate what you want to spend. If you are not generating, how do you want to spend more? The economy is with IMF. Your, 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 your debt is about 70% to GDP. Mm and you want to continue to spend, where are you going? You must be talking about how we can raise more revenue. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. It doesn't happen anywhere. So if we can't raise more revenue, you must cut down on spending. 
as simple as ABCD. You understand? Mm -hmm. So when we are looking at some of these things and we are talking about this, thing, we must look at the critical action and say, in education, in the next five years, we all agree that we have problems with quality in education. If the pass rate for SSCE today, or what we call it today, is maybe 50% or 40%, in the next five years, we want to move to 70%. What do we need to get to 70%? We need A, B, C, D to get to 70%. Resources must be provided. Six months or yearly reviews must be done. Then we can order, okay, because of the reviews and the results that are coming, the 70% we are looking for in the next five years, we are heading towards it. Then we will say we are working towards mm -hmm. something. But it is like the results will come every year and the percentage hovers around the same area. And we keep repeating this over and over. And so the question is, where are we going with education? Because it's like we are marking time. If you look at the past three, four, five is years, it, it, what's the result? The, the, the past rate has been almost Elvis, the same is it, percentage. Is it, is it, is it the citizens uh, that have to show the direction they want to go, or is it leadership that has to show the direction that we have to go? Because, uh, I mean, like, as Ghanaians, we don't seem to know where we want to go, and therefore, if somebody comes to lead, they don't also know, know where you want it's to because go. It's, it's the leadership. It's because, it's, I was telling somebody this morning that if I had my way, the blueprint for this country should be written by private sector Ghanaians, and then we compel our government to follow. Because we, we are proving that Ghanaians can build world-class companies. Mm. We are proving that Ghanaians are capable. Because when they are in private sector, they do so well. So why is the public sector failing? Because the mentality with which the public sector operates cannot make you succeed. It's as simple as that. So, you, so, you, you, so I think if we make private sector write the blueprint, why would Dr. Cobrado for a former finance minister who established Unibank? A Unibank is doing so well. But he was finance minister in the government, and we said the government was not doing well in terms of our finances. Okay, UT Bank was built by Ghanaians. Margins Group was built by Ghanaians. Big companies in Ghana we are talking about were built by private sector Ghanaians. Casa Preku has been built by a Ghanaian. And so the Ghanaian well. has proven that they can build companies and world class companies. So Ghanaians should be able to build a world class country. We can only do that when you have the mentality of a private sector business. We have gone to borrow money to build a merit plant. This month we we're talking about mm. oil revenue at uh, Joy yeah. FM. And the argument is, okay, if the, we had oil revenue being saved in a special account, we, were, we have been told that in the past that we've made not less than $3 billion from oil. So if we had wanted to build a marriage, which we know that can pay for itself and give us some good money, why do we need a third party to give us money to go and buy the things on our behalf and we are now going to pay... 500 and something million dollars for something that could cost us maybe 350 million dollars. We could have gone answer. for a loan from that fund, mm -hmm. maybe for an interest rate uh, of 5% or even 2% because it's our own mm -hmm. money. We would not have been giving that contract to a private person because we don't have money. And we say he should mm -hmm. pre finance the project. And now they have done some calculation of financial returns because the money has gone in, the interest that will come, and now the project has gone to almost 500 million or over. Why do we have to do if we are a serious people who are planning? You see, so when we are a country we sat down and we, we just shout, shout, and we don't have targets, then we are not going anywhere. That's why I always say, if you talk any sector in this country, tell me if we really know the targets, what we are going, and whether we are doing assessment, whether we are heading there. At the end of the day, you come back and say, look, clearly it looks like we are really not heading there. But Elvis, with our pattern of you know, bringing in governments, uh, we like to see things before we vote. We don't like projections that have put some implementation or have done some aggregates. We want to see a street light, we want to see a borehole, we want to see a U drain before we vote. So if you bring a government in, these things you are talking about, sometimes you don't see them. They seem to be working in the background, like you correct teacher absenteeism, and you do those things you don't see. So maybe people won't vote for you, but they want to see some structure to come and but vote. But the structures we are saying is not sending us anywhere. Whatever I go in Ghana, I don't see the structures that looks like we are serious country going anywhere. Mm. What we are saying we want to see, at the end of the day, the question is how long does it last? Okay? Mm. We, 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 you see, I, I've always said that we, we will not get there by magic. We will only get there by consistent planning and implementation. Okay? If a, a community needs a street light and it has to be provided, it must be provided. But is it the street light that is going to sustain them? 
but we haven't built okay. a society uh, that appreciates that. Listen, uh, you know, like if we're going to take somebody to be an MP, let's get somebody who understands the law, who can really, you know, le you know, read and understand what legislation is about. We want the guy who comes to the funeral more often. Is it? I was saying this morning that this reshuffle, whether you like it or not, it has a, an election connotation. Mm -hmm. And there is no way a political appointment will be done without political consideration for the party. Because it is through the party that the person, the government is in power. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this uh, uh, reshuffle that has been done, there's no way the president can do this without political consideration. But as I said, what is the, th there's no problem if you're having political consideration in whatever you do. But you see, if we want to move this country forward, mm, we want to move it, we should be able to say in the next five years, Third roads in Ghana should be at this percentage. These are the areas we need to do it. Mm -hmm. When we do it, what will be the return on that project? Okay. We, as I said, you see, a private sector man will not put his money where there will be no returns. Mm. Private sector man is always concerned about returns. If a government will always want to spend just because of social needs, the government will always be in trouble. But if the government is managing expectation and say, look, even though these areas, we think that there will not be return on investment. For these areas, there could be some return on investment, and we can leverage on that to make more revenue to do the project we are looking for. We went looking for $3 billion from China because we wanted to use $1 billion to build the Ghana gas project. And I asked myself, why didn't we go to the stock market, raise the euro bond in, from the world market, to build Ghana gas, we would have completed the project ahead of schedule, and all the gas that we are now trying to have fled those days would have been money for Ghana. Ghana gas was just one year, some few months ago. But we have been told that the gas they have supplied to VRA alone, that is the lean gas alone, they made not less than $200 million. Mm -hmm. This is an investment that if the government puts money, you know that you can pay for the project three, four years, and then after that, all that you'll be getting majority of it would now become money that you can then use to invest in another project. So you see, when governments are investing and we are not looking at investment that will bring returns, but we're only looking for investment that will make us win an election, then our country, I'm sorry to say, we're really not going to move forward seriously. Okay, so because if we can go for a robot to go and pay debt, why can't we go for a robot to do a project that would pay for Jay's itself and still give us some, 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 some additional yeah. revenue. Well, Elvis, thank you very much. That's what time will allow us. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Elvis Daco, editor of the Finder newspaper. Well, that's all time will allow us. Tomorrow we'll be back to do this all over again. But the magic work is, it doesn't matter who reshuffles target. What is your target and what are you supposed to achieve? So at least we sat at home can monitor and praise you to say, look, he was going to do 10 and he's done 8. So well done. Tomorrow we'll be back to do this all over again. Elvis, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>